So tonight, part two on shame. So what we did in the very first night is understand that shame is a core belief about myself. It's a belief about my identity, and that belief is a negative belief that something's wrong with me, I'm not good enough, I don't feel lovable, I don't feel that I have any value just for being me, so I feel inferior, less than, is my normal default setting. And we developed what that meant, where it came from, and that for basically every person from complex trauma, they end up with shame. Because once they are neglected, or abused, or abandoned, or their needs aren't consistently met, they conclude it's their fault. So I must not be good enough, that's why I'm being neglected and abused. There must be something wrong with me, that's why I'm being neglected and abused. So they develop this developing self-concept that is all negative. What I want to do tonight is go into the next part of where does the brain then go once it's reached this conclusion that I'm not good enough. And what I want you to understand up front is this is all happening at a subconscious level. This isn't you sitting down consciously saying, I think I'm no good, what am I going to do about it? This happens in the mind of a small child at a subconscious level. So the first thing that you have to understand is the conclusion that comes is not just that I'm not good enough, but there's a second conclusion, is, which is, if the two people that brought me into the world have concluded that I'm not good enough, therefore I can be neglected or abandoned or abused, that means that anybody that gets to know me is going to abandon me or abuse me or neglect me. So, I can't have that happen. And so with shame develops a fear of abandonment. And fear becomes the main emotion that trumps everything else but at a subconscious level, and it's, I can't stand the pain of being abandoned, but I'm afraid if people get to know me, they'll abandon me again, and that scares me to death. So what am I going to do to never be abandoned? So that's where the brain starts to go. So the first conclusion is, I must hide who I am. Because if they see the real me, they will abandon me. So priority number one in my life must be to hide the real me. But the second priority is I don't want to walk around feeling like I'm a nobody. I have to somehow compensate for that feeling so that I at least feel I have some value. And then from that comes two other priorities. Though I feel like I'm not lovable, and though I feel I'm, I'm not valuable, I long to be loved. And I long to be respected, or to have people treat me as if I have value. So here's what begins to happen. I want love and respect, but I must stay hidden. So how can I get love and respect without people getting to know the real me. And that becomes the challenge for the brain with a person with shame. And so what I want to do tonight is develop that for you so that you begin to see what the brain is trying to solve, what, this, what solutions it comes up with, and then I want to go into some of the ramifications of the solutions the brain comes up with. So the brain develops solutions that it thinks are going to fix the problem, but it's limbic brain stuff. It just makes things feel a little bit better, but it makes things worse in the long run. So here are some of the very early adaptations or solutions the brain proposes for the shame thing, how to get love and respect, but remain hidden. So number one, never be vulnerable. Never be authentic. Never let people see the parts of you that would make you weak. So don't let them see you cry, because then they might look down on you. Don't let them see you sad, because then they might think less of you. So now you have to hide those weak emotions, not just your personality, but those emotions that can creep out, and then once they're out, people might think less of you. 
So that's the first solution. With that, you then put on masks. So they can't see the real me. So I need to present to them something that they will like or respect. I have to do an act or a role that they will say, wow, I like that person. I want to be with that person. And so you become a mask wearer. Some of you relate to being a chameleon. You wear a mask, a different mask for each person you meet. You know how to adjust your behavior to get this person to like you and how to make a different adjustment to get this person to like you. You're very good at wearing masks. We teach about the roles that children develop as they grow up. So you talk about the hero and the jester and the invisible child and the scapegoat child. I want you to think those, about those roles in terms of shame. Because one of the purposes of those roles is not just to help the family have less pain. It's to provide a solution to shame. So the hero child says, they can't see the real me, mom and dad, because they will reject me. They will neglect me. So I will be a hero. I will be super responsible. I will never cause problems. I will do extra chores. I will be cooperative with everything they want. I will never rebel. I will help out. Then mom and dad will love me and respect me. So the child is trying to get love and respect within the family while hiding what they think are defects. The second child is that invisible child that says, I don't want to be a burden to mom and dad. That's why they don't like me. That's why they abuse me and neglect me. So I will have zero need. I will never ask for anything. I will never share with them my dreams or desires or wants because then I might be a burden. So I have to somehow fade into the wallpaper and have zero needs or des desires. Then maybe mom and dad will say, that's a good kid. And they will respect me and love me. So still trying to solve shame. Then the jester child or the comedian says, I will hide behind humor. People won't see the real me. Mom and dad will never see the sad parts of me, the parts of me that are painful and might be a burden to them. I'll make them laugh all the time. I'll make them so they're always wanting to be with me and have me around because I just make life fun and enjoyable and everybody's happy trying to solve their shame. So that is one way to look at the role. Another thing that happens naturally in the brain is this. If I am perfect, people will love me and respect me. If I please everybody, people will love me and respect me. So I won't let them see the real me. I will just be a perfectionist or a people pleaser. And then I'll get the love and the respect that I long for. Now do you see the flaw in this? You get immediate love and respect for what goes on in your head. You go, you're being a phony. If they knew the real you, they wouldn't be loving you and respect you. So this whole thing is getting you love and respect and it feels good, but it doesn't satisfy because you know it's an act. So that becomes the problem of this. Another solution the brain proposes is, I must lie about who I really am. I must lie about things that I do that I think might get me judged. I must keep secrets about struggles I have, failures I have, because I have to hide. And so to hide effectively, I have to become a good liar. And I have to become a good secret keeper. So again, you can see that might work in getting people to like you and respect you, but it sure isn't going to make a healthy relationship down the road if you keep lying and keeping secrets all the time. It's going to backfire sooner or later. Other people say, I will build walls around my heart. So some people isolate geographically. Who, who wants to risk relationships with people when you got shame? 
because you, they're going to find you out eventually. So I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to have zero relationships. I'm going to become an isolator. Some do that. Not many, but some do. Others say, I want to be with people, but I'm going to isolate by creating walls. And what they do is they let you in a little bit, but then you can just feel you bump into a wall. And they're not going to let you know anything further about them. They're not going to let the relationship go any deeper. You can bang your head against that wall all you want, but they are not going to let you in. They are isolating behind walls. Others say, my internal world is shame. I'm not valuable. I'm not good enough. All of those things. So let's just make a perfect external world. Let's focus on an image. So let's get a good job. Let's have a trophy wife. Let's have perfect kids. Let's have a nice car. All of that picket fence stuff. People will love me and respect me based on my image. Again, it seems to work, but it doesn't in the long run. Others, the brain says, the only way people will never find you out is if you control everything, including controlling what people think about you. So you have to manage the information they get about you. So if there's something on Facebook that says something negative about you, you better go on Facebook and put pages of stuff about how wonderful you are and how about how terrible the person is that said those things about you. You got to information manage and control everybody's thinking about you. Some of you have tried that and it is exhausting and everybody gets kind of tired of you doing that. The next thing that some, the brain comes up with is the only way people won't see my weakness is I have to be self-sufficient and never need anybody. I got to be able to handle every problem and never depend on anybody else so that I'm always strong and people always see how strong I am, they never see weakness or need. And some of you have tried that. And that seems to work for a while, but life delivers problems at times that we cannot handle alone. So those are some of the early solutions the brain comes up with to try to handle the shame issue, the fear of abandonment, trying to hide but still get love and respect, okay? Now I want to take that and I want to transfer that into how does that work itself out, okay? So I want you to think about shame and connection with people. So one of the things that we talk about all the time is that our brain is wired with a need for connection. So right from birth, a baby desires to connect with mom and dad. It's built into us. When a baby's born, we desire as parents to connect with it. We have been driven for connection. As we get older, we long for a partner or a deep, intimate relationship where we can connect at the deepest level. It is wired into us. Okay, think of shame this way. Shame is the result of not being able to connect. So what you might think of a time when you wanted to connect to mom or dad. Maybe you had a problem. Maybe you were hurting. Maybe you had a question. And you went to mom and dad wanting to connect and talk about this deep issue that you were struggling with. And they didn't reciprocate. They didn't let you connect. They didn't connect back. They were maybe too busy, preoccupied. They just weren't interested. So you tried to connect, but there was no connection. What did you feel? It must be my fault. Maybe something's wrong with me that caused them to not want to connect with me. So shame always results when a child is unable to connect with a significant authority figure in their life. So what happens from that as they grow up is they still long to connect, but now they're afraid to connect. 
So they long for that connection, but they're afraid if they do connect, somebody will find them out. So they have conflicting desires in themselves, a longing for connection and a fear of connection at the same time. And so they live by this rule, never be authentic. Always be phony. Because if you're authentic, nobody will want to connect with you. Your only chance of connection is if you're phony. But you go, that's not going to be real connection. So here's what the brain does. It says, I wonder if there's a way to have fake connection. I wonder if it's possible to have the feelings of connection without actually connecting with somebody. I wonder if it's possible to have the feelings of connection without relationship. And that's where the brain goes. And guess what? Our culture today offers you a smorgasbord of possibility of fake connection. What is barroom intimacy? Everybody hugs each other and laughs and smacks each other on the back and say, you're great, I just love you. And how deep did the conversation go? Less than one millimeter deep. It was superficial. There was no true intimacy, but there were the feelings of intimacy. And that's what fake connection is. So on the surface to the limbic brain, it seems to be satisfying, but it doesn't really satisfy at a deep level. It leaves you thirsty. You know what the, great, the fastest growing addiction in the world is right now? Internet porn. Why? Fake connection. You get the feelings of a connected relationship without a relationship. What is the purpose for many with a one night stand? I want the feelings of connection without the mess of a relationship. What do many people get through sports? It's the only time where men hug each other and smack each other on the butt. And, and and do all of that what is going on there we're bros we're on the same team i love you buddy you really because you have that warrior spirit we're on the same team fighting a battle and we feel close but it's fake close it's not real intimate connection so we have all kinds of things how about social media today you realize that most of our kids will text hundreds and hundreds of times a day or message their friends and they'll say we are so connected to each other but it is so superficial they haven't truly connected do you know there was a study done just a couple years ago about millennial children who have all the texting social media stuff and what they're finding is <clears throat> this generation that seems more connected than any other generation is the loneliest generation to have yet existed because they don't have true connection so that is the reality of our culture we have become a culture of fake connection and that is a result of a shame base let's see if we can get the feelings of connection without true intimacy now i want to read you something that Dr. Rachel Wurzman wrote, which I think is excellent, because it's going to bring the drug picture into this whole connection thing. So she's written an article, you can read it, called, called How Loneliness Fuels Opioid Addiction. She was on TED Talks as well about this, but here's what she said. The human brain uses naturally occurring opioids. So opioids, we think of morphine, oxycontin, fentanyl, heroin. Those are all your opioids. T3 have opioids. They're pain killers, okay? But what she says is this. The brain uses naturally occurring opioids to maintain a balance among important brain circuits that shape social thinking and behavior. So opioids have a bigger purpose than then deadening pain. They're also managing other circuits in the brain that have to do with social interaction. Okay? Making certain experiences like deep social connection feel good. In other words, when you connect with somebody at a heart level 
and are able to share in an environment where you feel totally safe, totally accepted, you feel good. Opioids are part of what makes that happen. Okay? These compounds, the most commonly known of which are endorphins, have a similar chemical structure to morphine, heroin, and oxycontin. A lack of strong social connection disrupts this balance amongst the brain circuit. So you don't get social connection, all of a sudden your brain's not getting what it was designed to get, and the opioid thing is all out of whack. So it disrupts the balance amongst the brain circuits that use these feel-good chemicals produced by close relationships. Now she takes that in a different direction. When we are really hungry, we will eat anything. Okay, we get that on a physical level. So now what she's going to say is, similarly, loneliness creates a hunger in the brain which neurochemically hypersensitizes our reward system. Responding to the pain of loneliness, our brain prompts us to seek rewards anywhere we can find it. So in other words, if you don't get connection, your brain gets hungry for opioids. That's what she's saying. If you don't have healthy, intimate, deep connection with at least one other person, your brain is starving. And if it is starving for opioids that it can't get from, relationships which it was designed to get them from, it will look for them in other places. So guess what happens when you find opioid drugs? It says, if we seek it with heroin or opioid painkillers, it will be like a heat-seeking missile for our social reward system. All of a sudden, our brain will say, who needs people? I just found what I'm looking for. I am no longer hungry. So people are set up for opioid addiction, she is saying, because they didn't get connection in childhood. And many of you can relate to that. Hey, then she takes it further. That's in part because of the striatum, which is our autopilot system. So I talk about your default setting, okay? So what it is saying is if you start putting opioids from chemicals, not from social interaction into your brain, it changes your brain's default setting and the drug becomes the default state that keeps the pain at bay and the relief close. Overriding the system that would otherwise prompt us to seek human connections. So why is it that many addicts, the more they use, the more they isolate? Because this system in the brain is changing and it is not saying I need relationships and connection. It is saying all I want now is drugs. And the brain changes. So now she goes to recovery. Recovery requires treatment across three categories. The first two we do really well in our culture. So number one, medical detox and rehab. We're great at that. Number two, counseling and therapy. Both of those are thriving. What's missing? Number three, social connection. That's been ignored in our recovery world. Now she takes that even further, okay? The striatum is what gives us the source of hope here. So your striatum's your default setting. So what she's now going to say is this. Your striatum, which has been changed to now say, I don't need relationships, I just want drugs. It can be rewired. It can be reprogrammed by starting to give it deep social connections that it longed for in the first place. So you can re train it so that it longs for deep social connections again. And if we do that, we need to practice social connective behaviors instead of compulsive behaviors. It's not enough to just teach healthier responses to cues from our social reward system. In other words, it's not enough just to give people tools to cope. We have to rebuild 
the social reward system with reciprocal relationships to replace the drugs which relieve the craving. Our culture and communities either create environments that are either full of things that cause addictions to thrive or full of things that cause relationships to thrive. I think that's powerfully very well said. But the problem as I come to the end of that is our culture today is programmed to make addictions thrive. And we, if we are going to help people change, we have to create subcultures which are counterculture, which reintroduce social connection. And that will reprogram the brain. And as the brain is reprogrammed and people are getting meaningful social connections, the desire for the opioids disappears. So that, I think, is very significant. But here's the trick with shame. Shame says, okay, I want to connect. But as soon as you say, okay, I'm going to try and connect, fear comes up. And it says, uh-oh, what happens if they find out I'm not perfect? Uh-oh, what happens if they find out who I really am? So what you're doing in recovering from shame is saying, I will risk connecting by walking through the fear of being found out. And I will trust that if I connect with the right people, it will help me to heal. But that is a scary step. Okay, second thing. How does shame affect relationships? We just did a series on codependency, so I don't want to go into great detail. But I want to recap for you how shame affects relationships. So one way to understand codependency is it's two shame-based people trying to have a relationship together. That is the best definition of codependency. So what happens is two people trying to hide who they really are, two people of masks and walls who are trying to get their needs met, trying to get love and respect without revealing who they truly are. And so that's why codependency has been called the dance of two shame-based people. Because they're dancing around trying to get their needs met, trying to not get the other person too angry, and that is an ongoing thing. So what we have said is shame basically says, I have no positive feelings about myself, because I don't believe I have value or I'm lovable. So if I am going to have any positive feelings about myself, they must come from others. So I must put on an act, okay? But one of the things the brain says is, if I'm in a relationship, that proves somebody likes me. That proves that I must be lovable. So therefore, to deal with my shame, the brain says the solution is, be in a relationship all the time. Because that will give you proof that somebody loves you, so you must be lovable. What then is the problem if you're not in a relationship and you're alone? Your brain goes, uh oh, this is proof I'm not lovable. Therefore, I got to run into a relationship. So that's why many shame based people, when they feel their relationship is falling apart, they don't just break it off and sit alone for a while. They don't break it off till they have somebody else risk. Because they can't be alone, because that would prove their deepest fear that they're not lovable. So here's how it works out. So you got shame in the rectangle on the left, the blue rectangle. Then people respond to shame in different ways. So some people respond by going to the gray oval at the bottom, the inferior position. I'm a nobody, I'm no good. And they just walk around with zero self-image. Others respond by trying to compensate and they act like they're better than everybody and they go in the direction of being a narcissist okay so what you need to understand is those two people find each other because what does the superior person